Saving lives and creating jobs, bringing it home. And the person who is going to moderate this panel is a dear friend and colleague, Jim Capretta, who is a fellow with the Ethics and Public Policy Center and one of the co-authors of our book, Why Obamacare is Wrong for America. Jim, why don't you have this on your bio? And um, formerly Associate Director at the White House Office of Management and Budget, where he dealt with health care, social security, education, and welfare programs. He is widely quoted, a prolific writer of commentaries. You can find him on National Review Online almost daily. USA Today, Politico, Wall Street Journal also. He is also um, a fellow with both the American Enterprise Institute and the Heritage Foundation. Welcome, Jim, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, uh, Grace Marie. It's uh, terrific to be here for this really uh, great session this morning. Um, our topic for the next panel, I think, is really, uh, couldn't possibly be more uh, important, really, for the future of the country. Uh, that is innovation for patients and as well for our economy. And if you just look at the, uh, the headlines and the debates that are going on in Congress and on the political scene, uh, a lot of it has to do with what are we going to do to uh, restore an era of strong economic growth in the country. And if you ask pretty much anybody on the, any point on the political spectrum, you know, what's the solution to that? They're going to have a lot of different answers, but one thing they'll have in common is we need innovation in this economy. We need entrepreneurial activity around new products, new services, new ways of delivering what the public wants and needs. And if we can do that, we'll compete globally, and we'll succeed, and we'll grow. So innovation is obviously critical both to uh, the primary objective, which is improving the, the lives of the people we're trying to serve in the health system to allow them to lead fulfilling and long lives. Um, but a byproduct of that is that America has led the world in medical innovation for a long time. And uh, what do we need to do to make sure that it's an even bigger part of our future? So I'm very pleased to, to be here, and I'm really looking forward to the remarks of our, our panelists. We're going to be uh, led off by Congressman Kevin McCarthy, who represents the 22nd District of California, which spans Kern, San Luis Obispo, and Los Angeles counties. He was first elected in 2006 and is a native of Bakersfield and a fourth-generation Kern County resident. Uh, after the 2010 midterm elections, Mr. McCarthy was elected by his colleagues to serve as majority whip of the United States House of Representatives. Uh, I think one of the most important parts of his bio is the fact that he was a small businessman at a very early age, uh, running and starting and founding Kevin O's Deli, uh, which he later sold to help pay for his education. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Congressman McCarthy. Well, well, thank you very much. As I said, I was a small business owner, and um, getting to Washington was a little different path for me. But how does it coincide with what we want to talk about today about innovation and others? Timing matters, and structure dictates behavior. I grew up in a family of Democrats, but I was the only Republican. I won the lottery the second day it started. I took the money, I invested in the market, I did okay. I created a small business. And in two years, I had enough money to pay my way through college because my folks didn't have enough money to send me to college. I open up a newspaper after I sell it. And it says, be a summer intern in Washington, D.C. And I'm thinking, that guy's going to be lucky to have me. I apply. He turns me down. Today, I'm elected to the seat I couldn't get an internship for. It was timing and structure. Now, how did that work out? I went back to the guy, and I said, you don't need to pay me. I don't need to go to D.C. Can I cut papers? And the guy happened to be Bill Thomas, a college professor that never stopped teaching all the way through. I come to Washington, and in three terms, I'm the majority whip, but I come in 06, the smallest Republican class in the history. But how did it get there, and how did we get the majority? Timing mattered, policy mattered, and it was the right place at the right time. I tell you this because when we sit on this panel, we all know in this room what needs to happen. One of our greatest strengths we have in this country <coughs> is innovation. The other countries know it because last week we passed a cybersecurity bill because people just steal our innovation because they don't want to do the work to do it and they want to copy it. 
But is the timing right that we can finally do something about it? I, I'm a firm believer history repeats itself. And before I lay out what needs to be done, I want to emphasize to you that I think the timing is right, because that's when you have to push. That's when we have to go the extra mile. Right now, it's similar in election process that it was in 1980. Have you ever thought of the similarities? In 1980, America had probably the same discussion. Was Japan going to surpass us in our economy? They watched Iran hold us hostage today. Iran wants to close the straits. Iran wants to build weapons, hold the world hostage. We're worried about China and India surpassing us um, in our economy. Every generation has improved upon itself in America, mainly because of innovation. But do you realize in 1980 was the first time as a nation a majority of us believed the best days were behind us? It hit 50.4. Today it's at 74. And what happened in that process? We had an energy crisis then, we still have one today. But we had an election, not about one issue, but really about the heart and soul of what you wanted government to look like and what you wanted the free market to look like. And that unshackled a lot of things. And the key to that was tax reform that unshackled and let things flourish. So I would tell you the fundamental thing that we have to do, one, in this country is reform our taxes. If we want to compete worldwide, we cannot stay in the malaise and we cannot stay with the current tax plan that we have. Now, going back to the basis why I say timing is right, at the end of this year, you're going to have the tax cuts expire, you're going to have sequestration, and you're going to have another debt limit vote. If you talk to people in Congress, they say that's all going to happen in the lame duck. If you talk to the whip, that's the worst time to deal with anything. I want the issues to be out front of the American public because after the election, I want decisions to be made. So you'll see some tax proposals get proposed so the country could actually make a decision upon something and that we could move forward. But that's going to be key. Right now, Dave Camp and I are doing tax planning sessions inside my office where we bring the members in. Don't just deal with the tax cuts themselves, but look at the overall process. Corporate tax rate is the highest, yeah, you have to lower it, but what about a S Corp as well? You can't leave them out there. What do you talk overall? What would you shrink? What would you make more effective? You want that process to be out front in the American public so they can make a decision. That will be key to innovation because it will unshackle. The, us, the other premise that I have that is the timing right, before now in the election, the Supreme Court's going to make a decision on Obamacare. We repealed it 28 different ways. I just want the Supreme Court to do it one way and get it done with. Key to innovation, if you tax something, you get less of it. We all know that premise. I happen to be from California. California always prides themselves on being further advanced than the rest of the nation. Have you ever studied California? We are advanced in some of the wrong things. We have 37 million people who live in California. That's 12% of the entire nation. But we have 32% of the population that the nation's on welfare lives in California. You compare that to Texas, Texas has about 6 to 7% of the nation's population, but only 2% of the nation's welfare population. We get 25% of our entire budget from 144,000 people out of 37 million. So when we punish wealth creation, we get less of it. When we reward government assistance, we get more of it. So a medical device tax is not going to help innovation. And just as when you tax something, people will find the home somewhere else. Tiger Woods grew up in California, went to college in California, left not the day he found a good price of a home on a golf course, but left the day he turned pro. That's going to happen in America, that they're going to find another place to go if we maintain it. So repealing medical device tax will be key and be done for before we get done this year. FDA reform. We cannot continue to lag behind. But it's not just that you reform it itself. You make it the reforms that allow other items to flourish. You want ideas. So I don't say that we just reform the FDA to make it shorter and flourish, but we create a structure that enhances people to start looking towards that direction, so you send a clear message. I personally believe 
And when you think about it for a moment, why did Lindbergh cross the Atlantic? Not because he wanted to ride a ticker tape parade, because there was a prize for it. If you go to my district in Mojave, you only go through Mojave if you're breaking down or on your way to Vegas, okay? <laughs> but if you read the New York Times this week, it was on the front page, Mojave was. It's a little airport, 100% occupied, when there's cities in my county that are 39% unemployed. Where Richard Branson has put a quarter of billion dollars. Where Allen put in half a billion dollars. Why? Because there was a prize to go to space. So they spent $30 million to win $10 million, but they created a whole new industry that goes to space privately. What if government also, not only did it reforms, but put some prizes out there to create a structure for people to focus? Because what will happen is, not only will the private sector focus, government would focus. Because they put a prize, they want somebody to win. And if they want somebody to win, the one thing they find out is there's obstacles that are created that government actually creates. Maybe we don't achieve it at the end of the day, but we drive somewhere. And what about the idea that we begin to live in a nation that we actually trust somebody? You bank with people and you give them money you don't trust with. You crave a drug that will save your life, but you don't trust a drug company. What about if we put a prize out and it actually achieves something and the country says yes. Thank you for doing it, thank you for investing, and thank you for curing it. That is a structure that also changes the behavior, which what we have to do. The final item that I will say is we have to be prepared when we do find that Obamacare is unconstitutional. You're going to be in the middle of a political cycle, but you're also, if you're in the middle of a political cycle, people are going to make a decision on an election. So you got to put ideas out there, because it's a unique opportunity. Three key things, tax reform, FDA reform, and appeal of Obamacare is the key to the innovation inside the industry we crave. I was just with all the UCs yesterday. The core of California's ability to go into biotech is our UC system. I was challenging them to start engaging because the ability for them to spoke out, but the idea as well is to produce ideas that don't harness us holding us back, but the ideas that allow us to flourish and get out of the way and let elected officials actually follow through. So I know we got other people to speak and I yield back. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Robert Sweetman from uh, the Oncology Business Unit at Pfizer Incorporated. Dr. Uh, Sweetman leads the U.S. Medical Affairs Team for Thoracic and Hematologic Malignancies. It took me a while to practice that. Much of his efforts in 2011 were dedicated to Zalcori, which was granted an accelerated approval by FDA in August 2011 for the treatment of patients with advanced ALK positive non-smell lung cancer. Uh, he, uh, prior to joining the pharmaceutical industry, he served as a uh, medical uh, doctor in the Navy with a distinguished uh, career. And uh, please welcome uh, Dr. Sweetman. <clears throat> thanks, Jim, and uh, thanks you, thank to the organizers and Grace Marie for the wonderful opportunity to be able to participate in what's been a, just a fascinating uh, morning, and uh, uh, I'll, uh, I'll um, say that, you know, as a physician specialist, we always have this sort of what I consider a, a solar complex, meaning we think the whole world revolves around us, and, and uh, as a practicing oncologist as well as uh, doing oncology drug development, you know, I, I sort of think the whole world has cancer, and it, uh, but I know that it doesn't. And I know right now it's a, a small piece of, of health care. But it's really important. I would, uh, you know, probably there's nobody, uh, if I asked a question here, who hasn't been touched by cancer or, or a family member that has. And we know that this is, you know, devastating news when it happens. And so I, what I want to go over today in, in the spirit of innovation is really how an oncology drug development we're changing how we looked at it. And I hope to tell you why we're changing it, and I hope to convey to you of what the potential benefits can be when that happens. My disclosures, I am an employee 
from that. And um, I tried to not get very technical. I didn't want anybody to be gasping at uh, survival curves or, 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 but if I had known John was going to do his primer about uh, uh, college biology, again, I may have gotten it a little bit more technical on you. But, you know, here is uh, a couple of survival curves over the last 35 years with breast cancer on the top and lung cancer on the bottom. Now, don't focus exactly just between the, the, the distance between the two curves. That's the most obvious, and that's, there's multiple reasons, and I'm not telling you today that I think that all tumor types have to have overlapping survival curves. But more interesting is the slope between that. So if you look at the last 35 years, there's been about a 15% increase uh, in survival with breast cancer. And for lung cancer, it's been about a third of that only 4% over this, these last years. And so if we're going to make a difference, you know, we're going to turn to technology and thinking about ways to, to treat patients differently, thinking about their diseases differently, uh, because when we see uh, laggard uh, uh, survival curves like we do in lung cancer, or you can see in breast cancer in the last sort of five or, or 10 years, we're plateauing. And you know, Dr. Hansen had, had talked a little bit about that, uh, different approaches to breast cancer as well. So these are the places where there's opportunity there. Um, 500 people in the United States died of lung cancer yesterday. If you take that global number up, it's about 3,500 every day, over 1.2 million people worldwide. And when I say lung cancer, every one of you had a picture of a, of a patient with lung cancer. But we have to sort of stop that, just because we have to look at them differently. We have to look at them in a molecular level that I'm going to go at. Because I can tell you that there's been a 14-year-old with lung cancer, which I guarantee you is not the first image that popped into all of your minds uh, when I mentioned that. So we have to move away, and I'll use lung cancer as an example, from treating one size fits all. Right now, up to the last you know, several years, there's been about three types of lung cancer. People characterize them into them just by the way they look under you know, the microscope, the same microscope that you looked at that you had in college um, in, a, in a baby biology class. And we treated them pretty much all the same for that. And if you look at that, what's driving that on a molecular level, so what that is really looking at is to saying, looking at the DNA and the alterations with the DNA in that tumor, what is really making it uncontrolled cell growth? Because that's all cancer is. Let me demystify you for that. It is uncontrolled cell growth. There's supposed to be processes in our body that, that make us stop growing so we don't look like a hippo in uh, Dr. Henson's slides. But um, and the same sort of things with tumors. It shouldn't sort of happen, but it does. So if we look at just within lung cancer in 1987, we only knew one molecular driver with lung cancer uh, that's there. And then the next 20 years wasn't much progress. We only had a two. And then the last five or seven years, and really over the last couple years, we're really looking at that lung cancer is not just one type of cancer. It's probably a dozen or more that we know. And there's still an unknown chunk of that pie right there. But more and more, that's going to get sliced down and broken down. And that becomes targets for drug therapy uh, for that. And I think that it's. Um, Amazing when you're sort of thinking of lung cancer being the most common tumor, uh, accounts for more deaths globally than, than several of the next all combined for that. And where we really need to advance is to think about that this isn't the most common type of cancer. It's really a bunch of rare tumor types when you sort of look at that. When you, you know, just in, in terms of ALK positive lung cancer, which was where we had, had approval in, that's about four or 5,000 patients per year in the United States for that. So only we're going to make big gains when we start treating them as sort of separate types of entities. So how are we doing with that? Well, this is my most optimistic slide. It would be more impressive if I had better PowerPoint skills, but I, you know, I, I take successes where they come. So way to the left is a genetic alteration in the bottom called BCR ABLE. And uh, you don't need to know anything more than that other than it's a, um, a, a genetic marker within certain types of leukemia. It took us 41 years from when we first knew that that uh, alteration was driving that cancer before we had a therapeutic drug for that, which was a landmark drug. Um, and then 
EGFR, which was a type of lung cancer, had a, an approved drug in 2003. And that took 26 years. And then last year was a banner year for approvals, actually, within targeted therapies for oncology within the FDA. BRAF is, an, is a type of melanoma, and it was only nine years from when approval, when the, the target was first uh, described to when there was a drug approval. And ALK, which is a type of uh, non-small cell lung cancer and a drug Zalcori that I had the privilege of being part of last year, was only four and a half years uh, from when it was first described in a Nature publication to when uh, we had a, an approval last year. That's remarkable, right? So this is driven a lot by technology of, of uh, you know, sequencing the human genome, and, and we're taking advantage of that, right? It's, um, but there were, there were naysayers. They said to us when we first, you know, had, saw this uh, uh, publication of describing this population, people say, you'll never be able to find these patients, right? We did. We partnered with a diagnostic company um, and, you know, and, and academics and patient advocacy groups because it was important, because it was moving this needle uh, uh, for that. And as well as, you know, regulatory authorities, right, people said, they won't see this subset of lung cancer as a, a, a subset of lung cancer. They're just going to, and they didn't actually, you know. And we partnered well with the, both the device part of the FDA as well as the therapeutic part of it. So it can be done. And and, and how is that? How is how are we shrinking those timelines from a, a target to an approval? It's because we're looking at it sort of differently of how we develop those sort of drugs. And there's a recent article in the Wall Street uh, Journal um, by Jonathan Rockoff that he did just a great analogy in my mind. Because now with, with technology and now that we understand these targets better and we understand their three-dimensional structure, we can sort of say, well, maybe we can fit a, find a drug that will fit into that to block that tumor cell from proliferating. And, and that's exactly what we're sort of doing. The analogy he used that made it very simple in my mind to understand is that if we look at that molecular structure of, of, of where that target is as, as the lock, and then the drug is the key, traditionally, we've been having a key as a drug, and then like, you know, Goldilocks, we go from lock to lock to see which one it might open for that. And now, this is really, now that we understand this lock, can we m make a key that will go into that? Why does this matter? So here's the potential benefits. So this is really a niche population, right? These are all going to be niche populations. The scientific hypothesis here is that if you target this better, this will translate into a larger treatment effect. So there'll be more benefit from this sort of drug. So how is that innovative? How does that translate into real uh, uh, benefit? Well, if you're hypothesizing a larger effect, your, tr your trials can be much smaller. Where we've kind of been with oncology is that we have large trials, we treat everyone on them, and then we look at these subsets retrospectively to see were there people that did better and how can we understand that. Now we think we understand it better, so select these patients up front. Smaller trials, faster completion, more people enroll in trials because they perceive the benefit to be there um, for that. In lung cancer, generally response rates for unselected drugs are around 20%. That means 80% of the time the drug is going to be helping them. Right? How many times would you order lunch if they got it wrong 80% of the time? Right? If you had to order lunch five times to get your right entree, we shouldn't accept that. We shouldn't accept it here. Um, if we have these treatment effects in, in trials, uh, you know, we've seen the regulatory authorities are willing to give faster approvals. Our review time for the FDA was five months. It's quite remarkable. So you know, is this personalized medicine? And the more I get into personalized medicine, um, the less I understand it, and everyone kind of uses a different definition of it. Um, and I'll be a, a bit um, uh, uh, controversial here, perhaps, when I, I, how do I define the success? I think success is when we stop talking about personalized medicine, when 
It's just medicine. I've never walked into a patient room and said, today I'm practicing personalized medicine on you, right? So when we incorporate this, this stuff, when we get these genomic analyses that are in the chart that doctors routinely look at, we'll stop saying that this is personalized medicine and it's just medicine. That's when I think we're going to realize the gains. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Jonathan Rennert. Rennert. Uh, Jonathan is the president of Zoll Medical Corporation based in Chelmsford, Massachusetts. Uh, the corporation was recently acquired by Asahi Kasei Corporation of Japan. Zoll is a leading manufacturer of external defibrillators and associated critical care systems. Uh, Mr. Rennert has been with the company for quite a number of years, and uh, we look forward to your remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, and good morning, everyone. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to um, speak to you today. We've had a number of deep policy discussions, so uh, at the outset, I'll give a disclaimer. My talk is going to be very straightforward. Um, you know, my goal today is really to um, uh, give you a real-world example of how policy affects, um, you know, a company in what we call the real world. And so I'm going to talk about what the medical device tax means uh, for our company at Zoll. Um, so I found it um, interesting that the uh, title of the, of the panel here is Saving Lives and Creating Jobs, uh, because that's exactly what we do here at Zoll. Um, so my contribution to your medical education this morning will be to explain to you about sudden cardiac arrest. And for the non-healthcare professionals in the audience, um, that's not the same thing as a heart attack. Uh, a lot of people will, um, will confuse the two. A uh, heart attack or a myocardial infarction, um, you can think of that as a plumbing problem. So one of the blood vessels supplying blood to your heart is blocked. Your heart is a muscle. Um, it needs blood. But a heart attack will manifest itself over uh, several hours. Um, and if you are, are brought to a uh, cardiac cath lab and, and revascularized or go in for bypass surgery. A uh, heart attack is a very survivable uh, condition in the United States today. Uh, better than 90 percent of, of heart attack um, patients walk out of the hospital. Cardiac arrest is different. Cardiac arrest is an electrical problem um, where your heart's natural um, rhythm is interrupted and rather than beat normally and pump blood throughout your body, it starts quivering. Um, your blood flow stops, you immediately faint, um, you have no pulse, no respiration, you're clinically dead. Uh, and if you're not um, resuscitated uh, literally within minutes, um, you don't survive. And so this strikes um, over 300,000 uh, patients in the United States uh, every year, upwards of 1,000 people a day uh, will literally drop dead of cardiac arrest. Um, um, you have um, what I show here is the, the survival curve. So if you are treated uh, with effective CPR and perhaps a defibrillation shock in the first few minutes, um, you can have a high survival rate upwards of 80 uh, percent. But for every minute that uh, you're not treated, your chance of survival decreases 10 percentage points. So 10 minutes after your cardiac arrest, there are almost no survivors. Um, what we do at Zoll is um, we're a defibrillator manufacturer. Um, we have several technologies um, in what's called the chain of survival, really looking at uh, helping uh, clinicians uh, improve outcome from cardiac arrest. So you see some pictures of some of our monitor defibrillators. The products on the right would be the full-featured devices you'd see in your hospitals or in your local EMS or fire agencies. Um, the product in the upper left is, is only 80 plus. Um, I don't know if any of you are planning to go through uh, either Reagan or Dulles Airport at some point in the next couple of weeks or months. Show of hands. Um, yet the, you look for the Zoll 80 plus will be the product that's protecting you uh, from sudden cardiac arrest in both of those airports. Um, and the point that, that I want to drive home about our business is it's primarily capital equipment. These are not consumed medical device, nor in general are they reimbursed on a per patient basis. Um, so the second part of the panel name was creating jobs. Um, and we've been very successful in our history at doing that. Um, Zola's been in business for about 30 years. And in that time, we've grown from a startup 
um, to the market leader in our small um, business of resuscitation. The top graph is the last 10 years of our revenue, um, where we've gone from a little over 100 million uh, in revenue to over 500 million in our last fiscal year. Um, you know, we've essentially been able to double the size of our company on average every four years for the last two decades. Uh, and we're quite proud of that. Um, but what we're more proud of is what that means for job creation um, in, in where we do business. We have, um, we had 1,900 employees at the end of last year. We're up over 2,000 now. 90% of those employees are in the United States. Uh, about half of them in Massachusetts, where I'm based, and, and Rhode Island, but we also have facilities in Pennsylvania, California, Colorado, and Illinois. Um, and we have tripled our employee base over the last 10 years, right? So, you know, saving lives, creating jobs, um, that's what we do. Um, and I'm most proud of the fact that 100% of Zoll's manufacturing and research and development, all of those jobs, uh, are in the United States. So we talked, um, a couple of speakers have referred to the uh, medical device tax uh, that's part of Obamacare. And you know that was one of the funding mechanisms to um, pay for the subsidies. And what this, this complicated chart has a fairly simple message. I'll try to walk you through it. Um, the, the, the top is really uh, looking at different parts of the healthcare delivery system. So you have your drugs or biologics on the left. And drugs typically, uh, more often than not, are used to treat chronic conditions. So if you take uh, statins to lower your cholesterol, you know, you can think of that as a, as a chronic ongoing condition. And your insurance status matters, you know, potentially when you're looking at prescription drugs. Um, as you move to the right, you get to the more acute parts of the healthcare system, including the hospital environment. Um, and on the far right, you get to us, which is the medical devices that are purchased by the hospitals. Um, the bottom here is there's really two classes of patients, right? There's insured patients and there's uninsured patients. And the insured patients put money into the left part of the healthcare system, and the uninsured patients don't. And the fundamental goal of Obamacare is to tr try to shift uninsured patients to insured patients. Um, the, the point of, that I'm going to make is that um, the rationale for a medical device excise tax was that, well, y the medical device companies will get more business because more people will have insurance coverage. Um, and that's not strictly true. It's certainly not true for, for our business. Um, medical devices will more often treat acute conditions, um, life-threatening conditions. They're not generally, uh, may not be consumed or reimbursed. Uh, in our case, these are strictly an overhead expense for hospitals and for uh, EMS agencies. Um, I can tell you right now, every sudden cardiac arrest victim is treated um, independent of insurance status. So I really hope if, if, if it should happen to you that the first thing your EMS team when they arrive on site does is not check your wallet to see if you have an insurance card. I hope what they're doing is giving you effective CPR um, and trying to resuscitate you. And um, so we, we know this isn't going to increase um, our business. And so what is the impact then on our company? So here's um, the same 10 years. You know, you saw a nice strong trajectory for both revenue growth and for em employment growth. Uh, this is our operating profitability. Um, I'll make a couple points. Um, on the trends here. One is that, you know, in none of these years was our operating margin even 10%, right? So people think, you know, all medical technology companies print money. That's not uh, always the case. Um, you know, there are a couple reasons for that. One is, you know, we're in a competitive environment. You know, our, our products are usually um, bid out among multiple vendors, and so there's, a, there's price competition in our, in our marketplace. Um, and we also reinvest uh, back into research and development to generate the next generation of technologies to try to innovate and save more lives. Um, and so that, that generally has resulted in single-digit profitability. Um, the second point I'll make is the red part of these bars um, are the taxes we already pay. So unlike General Electric or General Motors, uh, Zoll actually pays corporate income tax. 
Um, we've averaged uh, nearly a 30 percent uh, effective tax rate over the past decade. Again, while we've tripled our, our employment uh, in, in the United States. Um, the, the red bar across the bottom essentially, you know, boxes in 2.3 percent of our revenue, which in our case would come right from our operating margin. Um, and so you see there's not a lot of green left um, for us. We'd estimate our uh, effective tax rate would be well over 50 percent. It obviously depends on the year. Um, and in at least two of the last seven years, um, that tax would have more than wiped out our entire um, operating profit. Um, so you can imagine that's not a sustainable position um, for any company, certainly not for Zoll. Um, you know, what does that mean, right? It, it really comes out of our ability um, to fund research and development, to innovate uh, and develop the next generation of products. Uh, frankly, it threatens our ability to continue manufacturing uh, in the United States. Um, and, you know, oddly, I think, you know, it creates a perverse incentive because the tax is on U.S. device sales. Um, if we're looking at expansion opportunities, you know, it's far more tax effective to expand outside the U.S. Um, so it's, it's really a crazy policy position to end up in. Uh, and yet, as we sit here today, it's the law of the land, right? So, um, you know, even Elizabeth Warren doesn't believe the medical device tax is good public policy, <laughs> right? Um, so I'll make it simple. Um, you know, a, a number, you know, um, uh, Congressman uh, Ricotta this morning and, and Congressman McCarthy as well said the same thing. You know, if you want less of something, tax it. So uh, for sure here, we're going to get uh, less innovation, uh, fewer U.S. jobs, um, and um, ultimately fewer lives saved. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Our next speaker is Timothy Ring. Uh, Mr. Ring is chairman and CEO of CR Bard Incorporated. Bard is a leading manufacturer of medical devices for a wide range of medical conditions. Uh, Mr. Ring has a, uh, been serving in his uh, current capacity since 2003. He's uh, been with the company since uh, 1992, so 20 years. He has a long and distinguished career in business. You can read the full bio in the, in the program. Um, he's currently the chairman of the board of trustees of the Healthcare Institute of New Jersey. Please welcome Mr. Timothy Ring. Thanks, Jim. Uh, that's always the problem going last. All the good points have already been made, but I'll, I'll do my best to try to lend some more color to, uh, to some of the earlier points. Uh, let me talk about the device industry in a broader, broader sense. Uh, it truly is a unique American success story. Uh, it is a dominant industry uh, on a global basis, uh, clearly the world leader in manufacturing life-saving and life-enhancing treatments for patients. Uh, the the uh, description that, uh, that Jonathan just gave for Zoll is a perfect example of what this industry is all about. Uh, in 2008, the industry in the United States employed uh, 423,000 employees, uh, generated over $24 billion in payroll, uh, paid salaries which are about 40 percent higher than the national average, $58,000 a year, and invested almost $10 billion in research and development, and the majority of that is done in the United States. Uh, surprisingly, the industry is actually fueled by small businesses uh, and entrepreneurs. Sixty-two percent of medical device companies have less than 20 employees, and only two percent have more than 500. Uh, the device industry is also one of the few remaining net exporting industries in the United States, uh, exporting more than $33 billion annually, uh, and has uh, always enjoyed a favorable balance of trade. Uh, at the heart of the industry, however, as you've just heard, uh, is innovation. Uh, unlike uh, our colleagues in the pharmaceutical space, we don't manufacture products that remain unchanged for years uh, or enjoy periods of market exclusivity because of, of patents. Uh, instead, the industry is constantly innovating, bringing to the market new and better cutting-edge devices 
uh, that really revolutionize the way uh, patients are treated. The typical life cycle for a device is 18 months. I can tell you in our company, we, we do about $3 billion annually. We launched 51 products last year. And I'll talk about the FDA in a minute because that's important uh, in being able to do that. Um, you know, between 1980 and 2000 in the U.S., life expectancy increased by more than three years. Uh, this can be directly linked to the fact that deaths from heart disease were cut in half, deaths from stroke were cut by a third, and deaths from breast cancer were cut by a fifth. Clearly, advances in medical technology played critical roles in these outcomes. Uh, but as you've heard earlier, the device industry as a leader in innovation is being threatened, uh, not from competitors uh, or from within the industry or from overseas. Uh, the challenge is that governments are setting regulatory and tax policy that stifle, not uh, create or spur innovation. And it gets worse. This medical device tax you just heard about will hit every device manufacturer, whether they're large or small, uh, and it will tax on revenue, regardless if the companies are, are profitable or not. Uh, on the regulatory side, uh, Congress right now is debating uh, a bill called the Medical Device User Fee Act, or MEDUFA. Uh, the legislative process is just beginning in the House and the Senate, but it's critically important that that be reauthorized this summer. Um, the MEDUFA argument lays the groundwork for significantly improving performance of the FDA through increased accountability with more meaningful goals, more uh, uh, clarified process improvements, better metrics, and additional resources, which are desperately needed there. Uh, those of us in the industry, we want an FDA that's strong and respected, and we try to work with them to, to help them achieve that. We want the FDA to be the gold standard of ensuring life uh, enhancing and saving treatments are safe, effective, and quickly approved for patients that need them. Uh, I will tell you right now, too often in the application process for approvals, uh, things take longer than they should. Uh, and when you're trying to launch, you know, 50 new products a year, it's a real, it's a real deterrent. Uh, the medical device tax, shifting over to that, is a $20 billion tax. Uh, there have been some studies, third-party studies done, that says that it uh, will threaten up to 43,000 jobs in the U.S. at a time when we clearly don't need that. Uh, it, as I mentioned earlier, is damaging to innovative startup companies that are not profitable for many years after they're created. Uh, clearly is only going to harm economic growth uh, in this country, both from being able to create and develop innovative medical devices as well as the, uh, the jobs at stake. Uh, it's 2.3 percent uh, that's going to be somehow either eaten up by the companies or passed on to consumers, and again, we don't need that. Uh, the device tax doesn't take in, uh, effect until January 1st. Uh, it's already cost U.S. jobs. A couple of companies, Stryker, for example, based in Michigan, announced they're cutting 1,000 jobs earlier this year strictly because of the tax. Zimmer, another orthopedic company out of Indiana, announced layoffs in March. Uh, a smaller company in upstate New York uh, will close by the end of this year, eliminating 160 jobs, again citing the tax. And uh, the Cook Group, one of the nation's largest privately owned medical companies, canceled plans to build a new factory in the United States this year, again, because of the tax. So uh, with that, I'll conclude. But uh, Congressman McCarthy, I want to thank you uh, for your efforts. I know you support that. And I would urge you to uh, try to convince your colleagues to vote for Congressman, Congressman Paulson's legislation to repeal that tax. Thank you. Well, thank you to all the speakers. We have just a few minutes for questions. Congressman McCarthy has got to leave in just a minute, so I thought maybe we'd direct uh, the first couple of questions to him before he has to exit. I have one, and we got one right here. Uh, but let me just ask uh, Congressman McCarthy one point, um, which is that, uh, look, at the end of this year, they're calling it uh, tax Maged, right? Uh, for those of you who don't know, that the entire, basically the entire Income and uh, income tax code is about to expire and revert back to pre-2001 tax rates, including a very large tax increase on capital gains, on dividends, and on personalized income, which, of course, in the United States, most startup businesses are uh, file under the personal income tax. Um, what, what is your view on this? What, is, what, is, what are you and your colleagues thinking about this? What does this mean for innovation in the medical sector and as, as well as the rest of the economy? Well, we know, one, it would hold the country back. Um, 
<coughs> a couple different things are going to happen. We will show where we stand on, especially with the tax cuts expiring. You'll see something come out of the House. You may even see a tax plan overall. I don't know that it'd be overall, but maybe even to a resolution point that would show a broad spectrum of where we would go, simplifying, shrinking lower. What happens in the end is really going to determine on the election. I can give you every different scenario. We will keep the House. They don't have to win 25 seats. They have to really win 38 seats. I can give you a scenario where Republicans win the Senate, probably end up at 51. Give you a scenario where the President loses and Romney wins. Now, in that scenario, what would take place? Normally, if you're just having one thing collapse, it'd just be extended. Because everything's collapsed, you could actually think bigger and broader. But because you've just elected new majorities, you'd probably, and this isn't as the whip speaking, I'm just analyzing the past of what has transpired, you'd probably get extensions for a shorter time period while the new administration can enact, and that's why you would have the House moving already to be prepared to have something to move then, and it would be big reform. What happens if the Republicans keep the House and the Republicans win the Senate and the President wins? I can't tell you exactly because this President's not like Clinton, even though he does say he'd be more flexible after the election. That was. <laughs> if, he was if he was more like Clinton, he would have shifted on health care after New Jersey and Virginia governor's race. He would have shifted after the Scott Brown race, and he most definitely would have shifted after losing the House majority. So in that situation, you're going to have a lot of things up. You're going to have a debt limit. You're going to have a tax cuts expiring. You're going to have to negotiate something. What would probably transpire, do you negotiate something, but then you have a House and a Senate that are Republicans that could move a tax package and move it to his desk. Right now, he has the comfort of having a Senate that just blocks everything, so he never has something at his desk. That is a much different approach than he'd have to make a fundamental decision. I believe when you watch the primaries and you watch the election, this country is starved for some reform, but they're more hungry for leadership. In 1980, we had a challenge, too, was the other scenario. We had a president that told you, put your sweater on, and the best days were behind you. Today, the president tells you to put air in your tire for an energy crisis. I'm a simplistic guy. I grew up in Bakersfield. But to me, there's only two types of leaders when you become president, a thermometer or a thermostat. A thermometer only does one thing, tells you the temperature of the room. A thermostat is kind of a Reagan and a Winston Churchill. can tell you the temperature of the room, but can also change it. It puts everybody engaged to make it change country is hungry for that type of leadership and the first people to grasp it, I don't know if it's the presidential candidate, but maybe it's the House, maybe it's the Senate, I think that will drive more tax reform than anything else. Mm -hmm. I think we had one question right here. Yeah, uh, this is, uh, Congressman Asari, it's more for the other panelists. That's but, okay. Uh, we talked about the, the, the effect of the 2.3 percent tax on, on the device industry and innovation. But as you're probably aware, the chairman of the Senate Tax Writing Committee believes the industry has cheated them out of $20 billion, that the tax rate ought to be doubled, that their fair share uh, is actually $40 billion, not $20 billion. Could you talk a little bit about the effect of, uh, of uh, doubling the tax and what that might have on your industry? Sure. I'll, uh, I'll be glad to start. Um, uh, it would call for more draconian cuts. Uh, clearly, jobs, I think it would uh, move more research and development out of the Uni United States. Um, you know, it's an interesting, I was in some of those meetings uh, with the Senate Finance Committee, and it was kind of an interesting discussion. It's kind of like, you know, when you have little kids and you tell them to eat their vegetables, most times they won't eat it. If you give them peas and carrots, and you say, you got to eat your peas or you got to eat your carrots, pretty good chance they're going to eat one of them. We never had that discussion about no vegetables. It was like, you're going to get $40 billion or we'll make it easy for you, we'll make it $20 billion. Well, wait, what about the discussion about nothing? Um, you know, my view is, uh, and I, I've said this uh, to Senator Baucus, we're very supportive as an industry of covering the uninsured. We think that's very important. But why do we have a higher social responsibility to pay for it just because we're in the industry? Um, 
And, uh, you know, the comment I got back was, well, you guys have an image problem. And when I asked what that was, uh, why don't you tell us what it is? Maybe, you know, if we know about it, maybe we can help uh, figure it out. Silence. So I can tell you, it, the 2.3%, if you uh, follow the medical device industry at all, I don't know what your experience, Jonathan, and Sol's been, uh, there's been negative price pressure since this recession started um, of 1% to 2% per quarter. Um, and that's happened now for about the last eight quarters. So uh, even when this industry, when this, uh, the bill was passed, this is a much different industry today than it was financially two years ago. Uh, so another doubling of the tax would be uh, fairly draconian, in my view. Uh, any other questions out there? Um, I have a couple of questions myself, but for those who do, raise your hands, and we'll get the mic to you, and you can follow on my, my question. We have just a few more minutes here. Um, my question goes toward the uh, very intriguing comment made by Dr. Sweetman about personalized medicine. And uh, the one controversial thing he, he indicated, he said, uh, which is, um, you know, my question really is, as a practitioner of medicine and someone who's in the research business, um, when are we going to get to the day uh, when uh, people can, the kind of research you're doing will be um, readily and easily moved directly into delivery of healthcare? Because as I see it today, it's true that you're creating this kind of... Uh, of approach, but isn't it, isn't it held back to some extent by the fact that we don't have a consumer-directed health system where patients go into the physician's office based on, you know, a lot of third-party payment uh, issues. They don't re often really actually uh, have a lot of say in the kind of plan they're involved in. And, uh, and so, therefore, their ability to influence how the medical system is treating them on a personalized basis is minimized. <clears throat> yeah, certainly. Uh it's challenge, certainly there's absolutely a role for educated consumers, right? That uh, I, I often think when we talk about people navigating the healthcare system, you know, my, I lost my dad last year at 93, my mom's 93 here now, and I have no idea how they would navigate the healthcare system. I, I have so no idea, right? But I say they don't need patient navigators because they have me, but, uh, but, but nobody, ha everybody really has that. And so but there is a role for educating consumers, and especially when we're, you know, the ability to deliver this better healthcare is really driven by technology and diagnostic testing and getting that wide, you know, available from a billion dollar genome to a thousand dollar genome. Um, as, as speakers had mentioned, you know, there's too much data and we have to sort of filter out what's sort of relevant, but science will take care of that, right? And in this interim, until this is so easily deliverable to a physician, that it becomes medicine and not personalized medicine. We're in that interim where it has to be a bit consumer driven. So we do have messaging to sort of have to, you know, especially in the lung cancer field, to say to, to physicians, has my, do my, does my tumor have a molecular marker? You know, why am I treated like every other sort of lung case, patient in the world? And I think that there's absolutely a role for education for consumers uh, in this interval to get there. But I think we're getting there. And that's really what I meant when I sort of said, we're in this personalized focus, individualized focus, and at some point soon, I think within a decade, it's just going to be just medicine. I think we'll all be better off. Any questions out there? I have one on the, for the two, I think we have one over here, if we can bring the mic. For the two who have been involved in the, the medical device uh, business, uh, two of our panelists, um, you've been both involved uh, for quite a number of years. Uh, can you give us a sense of whether or not this implementation of the device tax plus just the overall structure of the healthcare law, what has it done to investment capital? In other words, I hear a lot of discussion that, um, that the uh, prospect of a very heavily regulated U.S. health system could potentially dry up investment capital needed for the new businesses starting down the road. You obviously are both in established businesses, but You've been around long enough to be able to, to give a sense of this, so I'd just ask for your perspective. So, I'll, uh, you know, I think the, the biggest challenge, um, you know, with the healthcare law, beyond the obvious economic things we've already talked about, is just the incredible uncertainty that, that hangs over the entire industry, right? And I expect, you know, if it goes, if it's not repealed, you know, the implementation that takes place over a number of years um, will perpetuate that. And I know, um, you know, venture investment, um, 
you know, firms, you know, uncertainty, particularly in the, in the regulatory pathway, um, let alone the economics, um, is just, uh, just the biggest thing that they're, they worry about because it's a variable they can't control. Um, so I think the uncertainty is as big a, um, a cloud for the industry um, as the hard economic things we know about. Yeah, the only thing I'd add, uh, if you look at venture capital money, which is all, often the, the source of seed money for these startup companies, uh, that investment over the last four years in healthcare is down 65%. Uh, on average today, to take an idea to get uh, a PMA pre-market approval from the FDA and generate the fir first $50 million of revenue takes on average about a $100 million investment. Uh, I was in a meeting recently with the uh, commissioner of the FDA and I told her in my 30 years in the industry there have been four discussions I've been involved in where we said, well, maybe we don't need to commercialize this product in the United States to make it profitable. Three of those have been within the last 18 months. So it's a challenge. Yeah. Thank you. Hans Kudner from the Hudson Institute. Fully identified. A uh, question for Dr. Sweetman. So I have uh, I recently had a conversation with some people from the American Chemical Society, and this is my first time after that encountering somebody from a research-based pharma organization, so I'll tell you what their side of the story, and you can give me your reflection on this. They're very worried about the fact that um, synthetic organic chemistry has been, for a long time, an area where a lot of chemists were getting jobs. And they're saying that, they're seeing in this most recent recession, the highest rate of unemployment for um, chemists um, since they began their statistical series in the 1970s. What they say, what they're seeing is that um, new models are coming out in, in uh, pharma uh, R&D, that there's a lot, uh, uh, lot organizations like your uh, firm are becoming a lot thinner, uh, and um, the rise of uh, contract research organizations, you can get your molecules synthesized in China now by very good US trained postdocs. So um, that was their side of what, what's going on in, in pharma uh, R&D in the future, and I'd like to hear your side of the story. Yeah, I mean, these are, these are all good points. We're all in the economy doing more with less, uh, for sure. Um, and I think from the chemical uh, uh, scientist uh, uh, perspective, you know, our, uh, uh, we value really our, our, our big main uh, uh, research labs are in Groton, Connecticut, and, and La Jolla, and um, uh, uh, we've won innovation awards uh, uh, for for this molecule as Alcori in the last year as well. So I do think that um, uh, we're doing it differently. I think the industry has to adjust because no longer are we sort of looking at chemicals and synthesizing them in the old way, and there needs to sort of be that adjustment for that. But we need to be smarter um, to deliver better medicines. I think the days of delivering a similar medicine that maybe has a similar uh, adverse event profile. Uh, for an incremental benefit of, of 2% is not sustainable, you know? So I think that this is the, the revolution that we're sort of all just adjusting to. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? I think we had time for one more. If not, uh, I think we're gonna break now then for um, uh, a lunch buffet, which will be served at the back of the room. Um, you can get your lunch, bring it to your places, and enjoy your lunch, and after a Several minute interval, our, we'll resume the program. Thanks. Thanks.